Chapter six is called Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and the fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come up with the lilacs and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and children have to play and to fish for trouts in the brook. Avery often brought home a trout in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning you could hear the rattle of the machine as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar in long green swaths. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake up and pitch the load and the hay would be hauled to the barn in the high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding on top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into a big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of timothy and clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in, and sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds. In the fields around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls, Oh, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. On an apple bough, the Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, Sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. If you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nests and scold, Cheeky cheeky, they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion's stems are full of milk and clover heads are loaves with nectar. The frigid air is full of ice cold drinks and everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, has a green worm inside. And on the underside of the leaf of a potato vine are bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there sitting on her stool when it happened. Except the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had at last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming because she could hear their weak voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were in a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its green, its gray green head through the goose's feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn of the after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations? Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck has nothing to do with it, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from his hiding place under Wil Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern and then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked nor trusted. Look, he began in his sharp voice, you say you had seven goslings, but weren't there eight eggs? What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? Mm, it's a dud, I guess, said the goose. 
What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton. If I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I will give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened his strong wings and beat the air to show his power. He was strong and brave. But the truth is, both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton. And with good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no higher feeling, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew that. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest, and the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte, and she laughed a tinkling little laugh. But my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What does that mean, asked Wilbur? It means that nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till he succeeded in rolling it to his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings off the, off the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came to Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely?